This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, this is a, a, quite an honor for Voice of San Diego. And, and first of all, I just wanted to thank um, Bill and, and Irwin for joining us tonight and, uh, and everybody for coming. Um, it wasn't too long ago that I had meetings, uh, one day with Bill and, and one day with, with um, Dr. Jacobs. And I, and I left both. And I, I realized that I, I was thinking so much, I, was, I, I get a nervous stomach sometimes after meetings like that. And I, I thought how great it would be if I could bring them together and share somehow uh, what I got from them with everybody that was in our circle. And I thought, gosh, wouldn't it be nice to have a forum where I could promote something like that or um, try to get people gathered? And I, I remembered that I actually did. <laughs> uh, Voice of San Diego um, is trying to become that, that uh, a place where we can, we can convene people around a campfire and talk about issues. Um, there's, there's so many interesting things happening uh, in the world right now with technology and, and how it's changing our lives. And it's changing our lives so naturally that I don't think we've stepped back enough to uh, realize what it's done. Um, I was really privileged to meet a, a professor from South, Afri South Africa who has a, a number of insights and stats about what's happening in Africa. Um, where in Ghana, for example, more people are getting the internet from their phone um, than uh, from a fixed um, um, laptop or computer. And, and Dr. Jacobs today was telling me about um, uh, that that's basically true for the whole world, right? And, um, uh, you know, the, in, in Ghana, the, the cell phone and the text messaging actually affected the 2008 uh, uh, election um, that they were having there in a way that they'd never seen before. And in, in many parts of Africa, there's... Uh, most of the discretionary income or a good portion of the discretionary income that, that um, people have is being spent not on um, clothes or, or um, uh, you know, some luxuries that we might imagine, but actually on cell phones. Even if they can't afford to use the cell phones, they, they, they want them. And they are um, even using them to leave missed calls on their, on their uh, friends uh, cell phones in, in a way, a, a type of Morse code where they'll communicate with each other by calling and hanging up and calling and hanging up. And if you do it a certain number of times, it sends a type of message. Um, the, the, the instinct to communicate is so powerful that um, um, no matter what tools you need to use, they'll do it. Um, obviously, uh, uh, Erwin Jacobs is one of the reasons they even have s uh, cell phones. In fact, he's as responsible for that around the world as anyone is. And, um, and, and of course, uh, Bill Stensrud is, is a founder of, of one of the companies that, that helped make it possible for the internet to, um, to even be what it is today. And with all these changes, uh, Voice of San Diego isn't uh, um, a farmer in Africa, but we are a, a, an entity that has benefited from what technology has allowed us to do in the sense of do impressive uh, journalism, at least we think so, um, and, and get it out to people for um, almost nothing as far as money is concerned. So it's an incredible honor for me to have uh, uh, both uh, Dr. Jacobs and, and Mr. Sandrud up here today, and thank you for coming. I, um, I, I wanted to begin, and it's my goal to now sit back and, and, and uh, as much as I like to hear myself talk, sit back and, and listen in the sense that um, uh, Dr. Jacobs, did, did you imagine that um, what we're seeing in Africa and what you've seen around the world um, with cell phones in particular, um, did you ever imagine that it would be that powerful as, a, as an information sharing technology? Well, of course, there are about 5 billion subscribers right now around the world and there's, what, population of 7 billion or something? So, no, you could never have predicted that very easily. And of course, I think it was back in 1985 that there was a consulting operation in Boston that, in response to a uh, request from AT&T, looked into it and said there might be a million cell phones by the year 2000. And they were within a few orders of magnitude, but <laughs> underestimated. 
So no, it's, it's hard to have uh, predicted this. And that's an uh, issue of the phones being very popular and needed, really, in uh, developing countries uh, has impacted us in another way that we didn't quite predict. We were working on a microfinance program with uh, Grameen Foundation, something called the Village Phone, where one provides a box uh, that a usually woman can buy that has the phone and larger antenna, marketing materials, battery, uh, an agreement with a local phone company so that they can go out and sell service. And for a couple of years, that worked out quite well. But now everyone's getting their own cell phone, and so that slowed down their business. But it was interesting, uh, in fact, I was just having a discussion a few days ago, that despite that, the women who were involved just picked up this feeling about being entrepreneurial and now we're looking at a variety of other services that they can offer. And so that's working uh, out well. And among those, of course, is just uh, basically micro-banking in a sense that uh, uh, most of these countries, of course, don't have credit cards, very little money, but ways of an entrepreneur in each village uh, acting as a local banker, communicating with another one by, through the phones, and being able to set up a, a, a financial network that way. And so a lot of things you don't expect happen. And in fact, that's, that's the case in general. You even you set up a company, you, you have some thoughts, things develop, you're open to new ideas, and lots of things happen that you wouldn't have predicted initially. So it's exciting. I think that's one of the themes is you, you don't necessarily see the future, but you um, you know, you, you start putting things together and the future emerges out of it. Um, Bill, you were a founder of, of Stratacom, um, a company that was, you know, key for innovations that made the internet possible, I think we can all say. What, did you ever imagine that um, the internet would deliver um, talk of the nation to my, my phone when I'm driving across California? Um, well, I mean, I, I started working on the internet at Bell Labs in the 70s when it was called the ARPANET. And um, it was a primarily a network designed for defense and educational institutions. And um, it was a very primitive network, but it was a powerful concept. And I, I think part of what you really have to realize, the power of technology to me that's been occurring since you know I started in the 70s is the ability to distribute innovation I mean, we, didn't, we had no idea what would happen to the ARPANET, but a guy in Chicago developed the first browser, and somebody in Switzerland developed hypertext markup language, and pretty soon these things took on a life of their own and created more and more opportunities to innovate. And, you know, the, 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 the beauty of cell phones and what the story Irwin was just telling was that a, a woman in Ghana can begin a, her own business, can innovate uh, with the power of the cell phone. I'm involved with a wonderful young lady named Margot Dracos who was nominated to be part of what they call the Young Global Leaders subset of the World Economic Forum. And she's involved with a group in Pakistan where they are using cell phones, SMS services on cell phones to teach math. Um, they have developed a, a, a gaming system on cell phones and when the young kids play the game and they collect a certain number of points they get some benefits for that and it's and it's it's proven to be quite an effective mechanism to reach an audience with a that could not otherwise be reached. And these are just examples of the unbelievable explosion of distributed innovation that comes from this technology and the ability for people to all over the world in unlikely places to contribute. Did I have any insight into that when it started? <laughs> Absolutely not. But uh, it's, it's uh, as Erwin said, you know, you, you don't necessarily know it's a happy accident, and it's, uh, it's something that's re really changed the world. Now, I'll add uh, a little bit of history on the internet aspect, on the ARPANET. Actually, it was back in a link a bit, my first company, and uh, we uh, did get very early on a contract 
uh, from DARPA to extend the ARPANET over to Europe and do that by satellites, which was uh, the best means for doing that at the time. Actually, we went over to Europe, visited all the PTTs, the telephone companies, tried to get them on board with packet switching and you know, great future. And uh, I often say they fed us a great lunch and then threw us out, had very little interest. But uh, we did get some government labs and some uh, universities to work with us. And so we built this satellite link over to Europe. Uh, there was another group working on what they called at the time packet radio, of course that's cell phones pretty much now. But um, and so there were three different networks using three different protocols. And the Bob Kahn and another developed the internet protocol to connect different networks together. That's the internet aspect of it. And uh, so back in, I think it was eight, uh, 1987, we actually did an experiment where we connected the three networks using the first of the internet protocols. And of course, at that time, didn't really think too much about it. But uh, they did celebrate the 25th anniversary of that at the Computer History Museum a few years back. So these things do happen. You, you, you put things in place, you let good people work on them, and then you get surprised. You know, your story about going to Europe reminds me of the story of Alexander Bra Graham Bell trying to sell a telephone to Western Union uh, <laughs> for a hundred bucks. And they just, uh, the Western Union management was absolutely convinced no one would ever want to talk over a telephone, and so they turned him down. And uh, so what you see going on today is a process of creative destruction. Um, you know, the people who, or the, the organizations that tend to be in power, whether they're newspapers or music uh, um, uh, uh, studios, or, or they're, they're, being, um, they're being affected in a destructive way by the internet, but what you're seeing come out of the bottom of that is the phoenix rising from the ashes. Uh, Voice of San Diego is a good example of, a, of an organization that emerged to fill a gap left by the fact that historically the fourth estate was, uh, was occupied by newspapers, and newspapers uh, business model has been attacked by the shift of advertising and various other things and so you've got to come up with new ways to do it and that creative destruction is painful but it's good it creates a lot of new opportunities well, you questioned whether the um, we had too much feeling for about the cell phone being used for data for internet connections and access uh, when we started actually when we started working on CDMA at Qualcomm we did recognize that it would be very, the right technology for data, that we could handle data very well uh, with CDMA. But at the time, all the emphasis was on voice. And until the third generation came along, that brought on a lot more interest in data. And in fact, even after third generation, there were, and you can go back and read the papers, et cetera, everybody's questioning, why bother? Nobody wants to use data. There's no uh, killer application that's going to cause people to make use of it. Um, well, in some sense, uh, when the iPhone came out and showed that there was a user interface that allowed people to very conveniently use many different applications on a phone, uh, I think everything changed. Now, of course, the smartphones are the fastest growing category of phones. And more and more people are using them, the data access as opposed to the voice access. So there's a lot more bits going on data over cell networks than are going, than are uh, carrying voice. And so the world is changing, and luckily CDMA did work out very, very well for that. I, w I want you to know that I retired my iPhone for tonight, and I have a Verizon Android phone. <laughs> but just speaking of you know, data and handhelds, I mean, the last four books that I've read have been on my handheld. Um, what, what are you seeing about what's happening to our lives um, and, and, and how fast it's happening that, that people need to understand whether you run an arts organization or a school or a government. Um, do you think people are, are really absorbing the power of that sort of information sharing and, and consuming? Well, I remember when my son was about 21 or 22, my oldest son, um, I, he happened to make a comment that he had never talked to a teller in a bank. Uh, ever in his life. And my mother, who was uh, still around at the time, uh, had never used a teller machine 
in a bank ever in her life. And so I feel like the transitional generation, I speak both languages. I speak teller and automatic teller <laughs> machine. Um, I, I think what you're seeing is a huge generational shift. Uh, for the last three years, um, the actual number of hours the average American has watched television has declined which after 50 years of going up, it's going down. Uh, the use of television, the couch potato generation, of which Erwin and I are members, um, is, uh, is on its way out. And the new generation is uh, much more interactive. The world is changing dramatically. Look at the cost of a flat panel television set. I mean, you know, your walls are gonna be interactive at some point in the not very far distant future. Um, we were talking earlier today about, you know, what's gonna happen to channelized TV. Um, you know, whether it's on your, on your mobile device or on your, uh, your TV, the, the information you get, the programming you get is gonna be uh, on demand. It's gonna be from this enormous selection of, uh, of programs that are available and it'll be delivered on a wide variety of devices uh, and everything you want will be be there and you know there's some danger we will all live a virtual life but uh, I don't think that'll happen I think that's overblown well as far as the impact I think just about everything we do it's already being impacted to a small extent but that's just going to greatly increase uh, having these mobile devices we carry with us at all times that have large amounts of computing capability, connection to the internet available, and other you know, cameras and GPS, global positioning system locations, all types of capabilities uh, that we're carrying around with us, including then the larger form factors of tablets. And so that's gonna have a fairly major impact in, in beginning to now. Uh, one area that I think is finally going to be transformed over this next decade, for example, is education. And we've been talking about technology being used in education and, of course, trying to get laptops or desktop computers in classrooms and let people share them, et cetera. But there's a huge impact from having these devices with the students at all times, of course, as long as the schools and teachers don't prevent it from happening, from them bringing them in. And now, I think we're going to be moving more and more to textbooks being delivered over the smartphones and over the tablets and interactive, of course, and being able to mix in video with those and being able to branch depending on how the student's progressing. And so the testing, in some sense, will be going on on a continuous basis. And so I think there really is going to be great progress finally over this next decade and help us with this terrible problem we have with K-12 education in particular, and the lack of teachers that have appropriate backgrounds um, in science, math, technology, engineering, uh, being able to um, uh, now have some very good supplements from these devices. And about four years ago, we started a program we call Project Connect. We have a num number of different programs around the world to look at the applications of, of uh, wireless devices. Uh, this particular one we provided to uh, classes in four different high schools in North Carolina, uh, a smartphone for every kid, and they could take them home, make use of them. We worked ahead of time a bit with the teachers and had some universities help with curriculum materials. And um, then the first uh, year was uh, they were uh, using it to study algebra. And the results came out very well, although Always, the first time you do an educational experiment, the results come out well. But in any case, uh, there was one teacher in one of the high schools that she was a very good teacher. And um, she had two classes, one with the smartphones, one without. And the kids with the smartphones, 100% of them passed the statewide algebra exam. For the kids without the smartphones, only two-thirds passed the uh, uh, statewide exam. So fairly substantial difference. And we began to look into what it was that made that difference and clearly having some access to the teacher and teacher thinking a bit more about the lessons, et cetera. All these were important, these factors were important, but it turned out the most important one as far as we could tell was the fact that the students had social networking among themselves having to do with the academic subject. And so they'd go home, for example, a, a student would get stuck on a problem. Often uh, the parent couldn't help immediately go on and start talking to students in other parts of the 
state and get some help on that and so not get stuck having to wait till the next day but could continue with the homework effort. And then some of the other students would think of something very clever, a nice way of doing a problem, video themselves using the, the phones, send that out around and help others uh, with their lessons. This past uh, January, we were back uh, in North Carolina talking to uh, some of the classes, and one of the teachers said that, in fact, that was working out so well that rather than, and it was a he, he rather than he teaching the students the entire lecture period, that he let students give about the first half to two thirds of the lecture using some of these problems they had worked up and projecting them and uh, he could work with individual students and then perhaps just give a lecture for part of it. And so already a very significant uh, payoff there. I think now with the students having that, getting used to working with each other, it, it also raises another very interesting uh, aspect that they get to know other students, they feel some responsibility, they're helping one another, and I think they actually help make sure that they go ahead and graduate, that they, they, they don't want to see anyone that they've had this social relationship with over the phones uh, not be able to pass. And so I think that's another uh, significant factor. The phones, of course, have been discussed, are very much available now in developing as well as developed countries. And so we've looked under what we call our wireless reach program. We look for different ways that we might be able to use phones working with local partners to improve various aspects of people's lives. Over in India, we set up a couple of programs, one uh, to help fishermen, another to help farmers. And uh, for the fishermen, for example, be able to, of course, tell them about weather, safety issues, et cetera, but also where fish might be biting, which fish, and also which port they could go back to to get the largest return from uh, their catch. And it turned out that that was helping eliminate some of the middlemen and improving, of course, their return. In fact, that's been so successful that it's now being offered commercially. So it started out as a kind of a uh, project uh, uh, that uh, wasn't earning money, but proved to, to, to be very popular and now is expanding. And one of the other things I, I'm actually hoping is that it will encourage uh, the fishermen themselves to go ahead and learn to uh, read and write, uh, become literate, because they find, most of them are illiterate, but they find that they're able to get some advantage from the voice messaging, from little diagrams they might be able to see on the phone, and therefore the ability to read and write the messages uh, could give them even a better advantage. So a variety of these kind of programs already taking place and making some significant difference in people's lives. And I think that's why you're seeing these phones spread so rapidly. Just to follow up on that briefly, what, what you're really looking at is a situation. I attended a, a conference of the American Symphony Orchestra League where Alberto Ibarguen presented the keynote address. And Alberto is the head of the Knight Foundation, used to be the editor of the uh, Miami Herald. And Alberto said the big problem that newspapers uh, haven't been able to figure out is they have built on the model of I write, you read. And everything comes from the top down. And he said that the world is not running that way anymore to point to just to put a uh, some whipped cream on what Irwin was saying, people communicate this way now instead of this way. And the, the phones and the internet and all of these things have made this, this incredible connectivity possible. And that, in, in, in turn, has unleashed all of the kinds of innovation at, that starts from the bottom instead of from the top, that gives tools to people to innovate in ways that solves problems in their own lives that they never had before. And that creates, I think, in many ways, a much better world. It's disruptive, but it will create a much better world. I think it's also going to continue to have a fairly major impact here in San Diego. Uh, we, we have many wireless companies here, but we also have a lot of biotech companies here. And now we begin to see a coming together of the two with telemedicine, uh, with e, uh, M Health, mobile health. In fact, there are, I think, just a conference just being completed. 
but lots of possibilities for building sensing devices, monitoring devices to keep track of your own uh, certain aspects of your health, if you have diabetes, blood sugar, if you have a heart problems, uh, if you have blood pressure problems, whatever, being able to make measurements, feed them locally to the phone, which of course again is a, is a powerful computer, can filter out the fault signals from something that may be more significant, keep track over time of how you're doing, and then if necessary, or at you, or at the family, or at a doctor, or you know about that. And so I think there's going to be room for significant cost savings, and we're just beginning to get into a lot of these areas, but I think uh, here in San Diego, it's going to be a, a major growth industry. You, you once responded to an email exchange that we had uh, with a very simple phrase, I'm an optimist. Um, and you talked about education, um, that making this transition successfully, you believe, toward the technology. Um, Bill, are you as optimistic that that'll happen naturally? Um, I'm, I'm optimistic that it will happen, um, but I think the barriers are social and political, not technical. And um, it, it is interesting because if you look at the kind of textbooks that Erwin was describing and the kind of educational experience that he was describing, it is taking place today in corporate America. If you see how training is done in the corporate world today, it is, uh, it is years ahead of how education is being done in the public schools because there's a clear profit motivation. I mean, there's an incentive to do it right. There's an incentive to use tools that in increase productivity. Um, so uh, many, not all, but many of the tools that are necessary to change the educational experience and to use technology to do better exist. The, the cell phone and the ability to get students to teach each other instead of the tops down model, it, those, those things exist. We just have to figure out how to get it deployed through a system that is intrinsically resists change. And um, I, so I think it will happen, I just don't know when. Well, I'm, I'm always optimistic, otherwise you don't go ahead and get involved with st trying to start companies and, and move them ahead, because everybody always explains to you why it's not going to work. <laughs> so without that, you probably would back off. Um, there's no question, I mean, uh, there's huge numbers of problems facing us, they're facing us here, the worldwide. Uh, on the other hand, good education can in fact help that greatly. And so not only having it in developed countries, but in developing countries, certainly areas where a lot of the uh, terrorists are being kind of uh, growing up uh, without a good education. There was just an article, I think, on Pakistan uh, in the paper today. Um, providing that education can make a major difference. And I think people thirst for it, so being able to make it available in a much less expensive and more broadly available way, I think will make a difference. Uh, clearly uh, helping people in whatever uh, career, or whatever uh, way they're earning their living, being able to help them, that's going to be positive. Um, and so we're certainly going through a very difficult time uh, that will continue, but there's lots of these possible approaches that in fact can make things better and will over time make things better. And so we just have to keep at it. Well, I, I think in, in places like Pakistan in the third world where there isn't a, 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 an infrastructure protecting itself against change, it, the adoption rate of new technology that really improves their lives is, is likely to be um, very high, and I think it may be that the educational opportunities to, to prove out the technology uh, are, are there as opposed to, I mean, not as opposed to, but maybe in addition to uh, in the more developed worlds where, where it's a little bit harder to graft the technology onto the existing system. Um, one of the exciting things that Boise San Diego is involved with is helping student journalists at high schools locally go online and, and we've, they've launched in Voices of Lincoln and Lincoln High School 
Uh, Claremont High School is launching, uh, Mission Bay High School just launched, uh, Point Loma High School just launched their own news site. Um, but the, we ran into the fact that the, the school district blocks um, YouTube and it blocks Facebook and it blocks, um, it doesn't block Twitter, um, but it blocks several services like this. And I, and I, I, I was reflecting on an idea that there was um, a point when there was a study that was being done at USC where a, a woman, they were tracking a woman and her relationship with the, with the internet over decades and she was a 92 year old and she refused to touch the internet until her grandson got sent to Iraq and she realized that she could start following him and on Facebook and, and on the internet. What is the difference between something, an experience like that that she had and how do you, what, what is that mindset that allows that switch to occur um, where you realize that technology can make your life or what you're trying to pursue better. Um, and what is it that stops that sometimes? Well, clearly a need will drive you to learn something new, even if you're in your 90s, or some of us getting close there. <laughs> but uh, uh, my wife Joan is somewhere in the audience and she's become uh, an expert at uh, uh, texting in order to stay in touch with uh, the grandchildren that are all around. So. Uh, you find ways of, of making use of this technology. Of course, we've seen some examples in various countries that uh, uh, the various peer-to-peer -peer communications are allowing political information to move out very quickly, people to get together, hopefully generally for positive causes, but occasionally for not such positive ones, but just making a major difference. And then you see that various countries are reacting by trying to often block this communication as the schools that you were just mentioning are, are occasionally trying to block. I think that's a losing battle and, 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 and not a, a very positive one and that will get realized over time. But allowing the kids to have this greater freedom uh, of communication and, and again that was one of the things that was being demonstrated in this uh, set of high schools back in North Carolina, allowing them to have the phones in the classroom, some constraints on what they can uh, access but not but still they had that available, and that, it ended up being a positive as opposed to a negative uh, uh, impact. And so we just have to be a bit more open. Now this issue with people saying, well, I'm too old to, to go try something new, um, sometimes that's a good excuse, sometimes not. But uh, again, with the devices becoming easier and easier to use, and that does take a lot of careful thought of how to make that all happen, but as they become easier to use, then people will begin to, again, use much more of the capability that's available to them and just think it's natural. Yeah, your, your student journalists uh, remind me of journalists in China these days. I mean, <laughs> um, having the, the same problem. I, I, I don't think that prohibiting people from, doing, from accessing things is the right tool. I think, uh, you know, watch what they do, and if they do bad things with the information they've got, then fix it afterwards, uh, not before. Um, I, I think that the story of a 92-year-old adopting technology to stay in touch with her grandchildren in Iraq is a perfect example of, you know, change requires motivation. Um, and if there's adequate motivation, you will change. And um, when technology becomes compelling, when it gets to the point where it does something for you, you absolutely want to have done, you'll adopt it. Was it a matter of just showing people what it can do? Or someone in the family showing them, yeah. or again, making it easier to use, and so you suddenly discover, gee, I can do that aspect of it, and then let that kind of grow out uh, as you get a little bit more self-assurance that works well. But here we've been talking about people-to-people -people type of uh, uh, communications. And uh, also more and more we're going to see machine-to-machine -machine communications. Um, one example of that is uh, started out as being the uh, Amazon Kindle. And now that's spread, of course, to various types of tablets. But uh, that was a situation where you order a book, the book appears on the Kindle, and you don't realize that, in fact, you had a cellular experience, that the information went out by the way, for a period of time, was coming through San Diego until Amazon got all its uh, uh, software in order. But uh, the order went out, and then the material came back, and it was going over a cellular network. 
but you weren't paying separately for that cellular network. That was just absorbed in the price of the book. More and more, I think we're going to see different applications of uh, this type where, in some sense, you're making use of information over wireless, but you're not even aware that that's happening. We talk about the smart grid that we, we have, of course, huge energy issues to deal with going forward. And one aspect of that is um, to try to control the use of electricity at various hours. Uh, that requires communication both ways. And uh, we'll be seeing more and more devices that are keeping track and talking to just about every unit in your home uh, when they should use more energy, use less. We're seeing beginning of the spread of uh, plug-in automobiles, both hybrid and non-hybrid. And uh, I think there'll be controls on those, for example, that allow them to the best charge when the energy usage is otherwise minimized. Uh, and so there'll be a lot of these different cases moving ahead now where this communication capability is being used in ways that we're not even aware of. Who needs people? <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> I, I, I would bet that machine-to-machine -machine communications consumes more of the bandwidth than anyone would even consider right now. I mean, if you look at what's going on in the, in the industrial world and elsewhere. So, and it's only going to increase. You're right. Yeah, there was another case where uh, one of the uh, operators in Japan several years ago was talking about, oh, one of the major, this is one, people weren't quite sure how, how to use 3G, the, the data-capable cellular. And they said, oh, well, people will be able to put these little phone devices on their pets and be able to keep track of their pets locating them, which I thought was a little bit silly. But we supply such parts now, and people <laughs> do make use of them. And Keeping that's track another. of their teenage so, children. <laughs> as long as they allow that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. So there's all kinds of these different applications. And again, you make a capability available, and then all types of uses come up that you did not initially uh, visualize. We have um, arts organizations represented here, civil rights organizations, journalists. Um, we have a, a whole group of interest, uh, developers and, and interesting people here from San Diego and in San Diego operating. Obviously, San Diego has a, a unique place. What can what can San Diego do to maintain its spot as a as a as a beacon for this sort of innovation and, and the kinds of things that you guys? Well, I hope everybody who's listening gets excited about the fact that there's all types of interesting things to do in engineering and science, and kind of encourage the next generation to go out, study them, and and get involved. I'm, one of the real major failures in this country right now is that we're just not educating. K-12 and then college, uh, enough people trained uh, in the uh, STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, math subjects. Um, and as a result, you look at the universities, and in engineering, for example, it tends to be over 50% of the kids that are either foreign born or mainly foreign born, but some uh, first generation. But after that, we seem to be losing the kids in studying these subjects. And it is great fun, it is exciting, and if you wish, it's also a way to uh, make a very good living. I uh, have had the thought uh, that we should invite every fifth grade or so class in the city to visit Qualcomm, but not to go to the laboratories, to walk around the parking lot and see the kind of cars that the employees <laughs> here work. <will. laughs> <laughs> That'll motivate them. And don't get into nonprofit journalists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they there's still time to study. Right, right, right. <laughs> they don't want to rock around the Voice of San Diego parking no, lot. No, is that uh, what you're? <laughs> no. <laughs> our our benefit is in the mind. Okay. Psychic rewards. Right. Psychic right. rewards. Yes. Well, how do we spur that? I mean, I, I I worked with Mission Bay High School. I went to Mission Bay, and you know, I I they, their computer lab where I was working with them. It looked like the computers were from 98, if, they, if, if that. I mean, and they ran like that. And 
there was it was it, it was an awful room. I felt like um, I, where do we where do you even start to grapple your mind around this? And and can you know is it a subversive effort as far as like what is happening in Africa where everybody's just getting cell phones and, and educating them and communicating themselves? No, or? I think larger and larger groups are in fact looking at these various new uses of the technology in education, and there are meetings and people talking, universities involved, companies involved, teachers etc. Uh, there is some resistance to change. I, I don't want to be picking on teachers' unions particularly, but sometimes you get some of this resistance to, to change. Now, one of the things we, in worrying about this several years ago, 10 years ago or so, uh, we thought about setting up what we called high-tech high. It's actually a charter school system uh, with the idea of trying to encourage students to study these subjects and be prepared to go on to college to uh, uh, study in the STEM area. And um, it's actually worked out very well. There are about eight or nine or 10 schools now and keep growing. Uh, very much project oriented. Students selected uh, by lottery across the various uh, zip codes in the city. So it's a very good mix of students. But one of the most exciting aspects that I, I, I've had feedback on uh, has to do with that not only do almost 100% graduate, and so it's much better than the uh, current public school situation, but about 34% were studying STEM subjects in college. About 100% go on to college, and about uh, a little over a third of them were studying STEM subjects. So they were getting excited with it. By the way, one of the things they do, of course, is they all do have their websites and they have their own information up there in at least two languages, and that does give them a lot of familiarity. Working on projects, again, has this impact of they like to help one another once they get to know one another. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that almost 100% graduate. That is, students don't want to see their compatriots not uh, being successful. I do think there's, I mean, I grew up in the 50s and the early 60s when Sputnik and uh, uh, was all the rage. And uh, I mean, it was, a, it was an era where being a scientist was sexy. Um, you know, I mean, I read science fiction novels. I mean, the whole ethos of growing up in that era was, uh, I mean, my dad was an engineer, which probably affected my, uh, my own personal uh, outlook to, to some degree. But I lived with a bunch of kids whose dads were lots of other things, and many of us went on to be uh, engineers. Um, I think what happened was it suddenly became sexy to be an investment banker uh, instead of a, uh, an engineer, or to be a lawyer instead of an engineer. And I, I'm not sure what, what we can do, but I, I certainly the making people, kids in particular, realize that how much fun it is, how much, uh, how much quality of life, psychic reward, not just financial reward, they can get out of a, a career in these areas is, is, I mean, I felt from the day I, I was conscious of it that this is what I wanted to do. It was just exciting to me. And somehow, if we could figure out how to make it exciting to kids again, and maybe technology is one of the ways we can do that. Maybe we can deliver more excitement to kids using the technology that they can be Do you think part one of. of the major problems is that the voice of San Diego doesn't get out enough information on technology and everything that's happening <laughs> and why it's exciting? I, you know what we need for that is resources. <laughs> <laughs> Boom! <laughs> one point for Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I have noticed that though. With the, the you talk about the project-based learning, and and you know, with the with the newspaper, here's a student newspaper where it would be published once a quarter, and it was kind of just a mediocre news uh, yearbook or something. It was just a collection of writing. It wasn't a news source. But now that they're publishing once a week online, they really feel like they have a responsibility to gather information and share it and work together and and understand the technology. It's very fun to watch. But um, yeah. I, I guess I'm still struggling on how and how do we open the the minds of of this sort of thing? How do you how do you spur it? How do you encourage people to, you know, people in in your generation? There's a lot that still don't want to work with the internet. But what happens? What is that switch? How do we identify that? 
I'm not sure it's technology, but I will tell you, I think that the re there's a reason why so much technology is hosted in California. And I think the reason is because the, the, the state made a decision to really emphasize education a long, long time ago. And they built a system of community colleges, state colleges, and the best universities in the world here in California. And out through, I mean, Dr. Jacobs came here to teach at the U University of California at San Diego. That is what brought him here, and that's what brought Qualcomm and Linkabit to San Diego. The university system, it was the crown jewel the absolute crown jewel of California. And, and I, I think we've done nothing but make that system less effective at, at, at achieving its mission. In its original instantiation, anyone could go to college. I mean, the, the financial requirements to get into the JCs, uh, the tuition at the state college level were very minor. And even at UC Berkeley, which was at the time the greatest university in the world, the tuition was modest. I mean, I think we encouraged people to get educated in this state and the technology that emerged from that, from those universities, has created the economy that's, you know, the technology envy of the world. And if we really want to get people um, to double down on this and keep America in a leadership position, it's all about education. And by stripping money out of that system, we're eating our seed coin. And I, if anybody has anything that they want to get passionate about, that's something that could really change the world. And that's why I think that, in fact, education has, will and has to, in some sense, change over this next decade and make use of these tools because we just don't have, again, enough teachers that are trained that can provide that excitement about this area. This is a very exciting area. It's a wonderful way to uh, uh, have a job to go and, and, and be able to create things, but you have to be able to get that across. And in many cases, you'll be able to go to some special schools, et cetera. Other cases, uh, you, you won't. But by providing this information, some very good lecture information uh, over the uh, uh, electronic devices, I think we'd be able to finally be able to communicate some of that excitement that they may not be getting directly from their class, from their, their teachers. Uh, somehow, we just have to be able to make use of this and put out a lot more energy into making sure the material we can deliver over these mobile devices is substantial and exciting enough to get the, the students ex uh, themselves excited about it. We reserved a few minutes to um, hear from anyone in the audience that wanted to react to anything and talk and, and, and ask a question. Um, do we have anybody? Uh, so Bill, I also am a fan of creative destruction. And um, you also mentioned, you know, who needs people is quip. <laughs> um, but I'm curious, you know, with creative destruction, um, the technology is causing, how do you envision, what are we gonna do with all these people? I mean, there are gonna be a lot of people um, made redundant by, by technology, allowing fewer people to organize much more efficiently and, and provide services much more efficiently. You know, there was a group called the Luddites and they were named for a guy named Ned Ludd. And Ned Ludd was a weaver in England before the Industrial Revolution. And he put the Luddite uh, movement together and they went around and they smashed automatic weaving machines because they were putting the weavers out of business. But um, what happened because they had automatic weaving machines was the cost of cloth declined dramatically and more people could actually buy clothes. And as a result of being able to buy clothes, people were warm and they survived better. I don't believe that there's ever a case where technology uh, essentially disables people. I think technology enables people. It does so sometimes in a painful way. What, it, what happens sometimes is that technology takes a, a, a group that was dependent on a certain, uh, I don't know, uh, activity for their livelihood, and it makes that activity, it moves 
that activity somewhere else physically, or it moves that activity somewhere else logically, or it substitutes a different activity. Uh, but in the process, it does so because it produces better output at lower cost, which means people can consume it better, and which means normally that more opportunity is created for other people in other parts of the economy. It moves the, it moves the, the opportunity up scale and, by the way, increases the need for an education so that you can actually take advantage of those new opportunities because technology disrupts mostly at the bottom of the, of the, of the uh, job chain. And if, you can, if, you can, if we can encourage people to get educated, it'll create more opportunity, not less. Uh, what's probably the most controversial issue in telecom these days is the, the issue of network neutrality, both on the wired side and the wireless side, and Google just came out uh, that had been a staunch backer of this notion of network neutrality, and now they sort of switched a little bit <laughs> yeah, and really. it makes sense in the wired side, but no longer in the wireless side. I was wondering if uh, both of you, since you have experience in, in those two different realms, could comment on your opinion on, the, on what's the, the right form of regulation or lack of regulation in this regard. Would you mind doing a quick background on that? Well, I mean, network neutrality is, a, for those of you who don't know what the issue is, it's the issue of whether the the network provider, the company from which you get your bandwidth, can, um, can dictate how that bandwidth is used, uh, how it, uh, price it differently depending on the, uh, on business issues that they decide benefit them as a business. Um, and so, or should, the, or should all traffic be equal? within the network, and, uh, and the networks should have to charge the same for all traffic and not discriminate against any, any form of traffic. Um, and it's a really controversial issue right now within the uh, industry. Yeah, on the wireless side, there's a lot of competition. There are a number of carriers out there. If you try to do some restriction that's somewhat artificial, favor one uh, content company over a different one, uh, I think your competitor will take advantage of that. Uh, but one of the issues, of course, is we have a limited amount of spectrum, and so the number of bits we can transmit to everybody is limited by that spectrum and by cost factors, uh, how many cell sites you put out there, some new ways of getting additional small cell sites, et cetera. But all these take some investment to go ahead and realize. And so I think that we'll see constraints based on the total amount of traffic. That is, we all want to watch our own individual video, but that might overload uh, the networks in some cases. And so we'll be seeing some constraints on that. Right now, I think a number of the operators are moving toward not saying which company you can work with, but that uh, they charge you get so many megabytes or tens of megabytes or whatever for a certain price, and above that you have to pay more so that that helps them control the load on their networks, but competition will cause that limit to keep going up and, uh, and move in the right direction. And we will, because of the desire, the demand for these kind of capabilities, move in a direction where the networks evolve and will support more and more data coming wirelessly. By the way, I think more and more we will get wireless delivery, um, uh, although for our home for fixed uses, uh, they'll still perhaps be the cable of, of fiber coming in. But the, the issue when, they, when you try to get legislation is to make sure that it's not causing non-economic factors to come in. And so you don't want the companies to discriminate against, in favor of Google and against one of the other search companies or, or whatever. You want that to be fair, but, but there are certain uh, resources that are expensive, and so there, there has to be some charge, some control over those. But I don't think the issue of network neutrality is, is, is hinged on whether you should pay more if you use more. I think paying more if you use more is, is, a, is a very sensible strategy for metering out uh, the scarce resource. Yes, but you should look at some of the legislation that was being proposed at various times. It, it was a little less clear. 
Yeah, but I mean, it, it's, it's the discrimination of one service against another. I do agree with you. In the wireless case, what you face is a situation where there's enough competition so that you can rely on that competition to play the cop. But in the wireline space, many people have one or at most two choices of providers. And those providers are regulated because they use a public resource. They are not businesses like any other business. They dig up the streets and they have right-of-way that is granted to them by the public and they are regulated because of that and they should be regulated because of that and what that regulation should tell them to do I think is another issue altogether uh, but I do think that whether the, you're a wireless company using public spectrum or a wireline company using public right-of-way there is a right to regulate and the, there is a duty for that regulation to protect the interest of the consumer. Yeah. And I, I myself think the consumer is being protected already, so I think a lot of the motivation for this is, is, is not quite there. There's some fine-tuning that's always important, but uh, I think, in fact, in the U.S., as opposed to many other countries, the regula regulation was such that we could introduce CDMA, for example, whereas you couldn't do that in Europe until third generation. And so we've had a lot more flexibility here the competition wire or fiber into the homes. You've got cable companies, now you've got the telephone companies going in putting in fiber, but the other competitor is gonna be wireless, and so there will be more and more of this competition, and ultimately that does pay off. Well, we should stop there. I, uh, maybe that's the next topic. Um, thank you so much for coming, uh, uh, and thanks to um, Dr. Jacobs and uh, Mr. Sandra, We're, we've. Um, Voice of San Diego launched a retooled, redesigned website this week, uh, today. Um, and the arts section, you go voiceofsandiego.org slash arts, both, um, both uh, Bill and, and Irwin helped us, um, helped us put that together and we're very proud of it and how it looks and how it's functioning now. Um, so if you can check that out. We're also going to be trying to do a lot more engagement and, and events and of these sorts of things. So thank you for coming and, um, and join us afterwards. And again, thank you to our, our um, speakers today. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful honor for Voice.